But let us uh, concentrate today on the Sapphic and the Alcaic. <coughs> because these are Horace's two uh, favourite uh, meters. Ovid wants to make the elegiac couplet a bit purer, more elegant, less variation allowed. I think Horace felt the same about the Sapphic. Um, I think it's wise to think of a stanza as a whole, anyway. And yes, yes, you think of key concepts. Yes, what are you writing about? What are you trying to say? And roughly, how long is it going to take, hopefully? In other words, is the thought going to stop at the end of a stanza? Or is it going to run on beyond the stanza? And obviously, a bit of a run on is desirable. I mean, obviously, there's no problem if in your ode you have a, a firm stop at the, end of, at the end of every stanza. But lyrics are not like elegiacs. In other words, it is most definitely not necessary to stop always at the end of stanzas. You can run on. So, I mean, think about how long your concept is going to be. So, of course, your first sentence could actually be shorter than a stanza, couldn't it? Um, in which case, well, you may as well confine your thoughts to however far you think it'll take. Yeah, so what are you writing about? What are the key words for that? Where will they fit in the verse? Does that work or doesn't it? If it looks as if it's going to work, then yes, put the key words in their place and then fill in the gaps. So I, th I think, well, most topics will go in most lyric verses. I mean, I think... The alcaic that I'm about to talk about was Horace's meter for the, really the most important odes, the most serious subjects. I mean, the only, the only time he has a, a really extended set of odes in the same meter is the first six of book three, the so-called Roman odes, which are all alcaics, and those are seen as among his greatest and most sort of um, serious, thoughtful, um, dignified poems. But there are some pretty dignified sapphics. I think sapphics are certainly one of the better meters for lighter lyric, something a little bit humorous. And that little adonic, the, the short fourth line, that does lend itself to witty, witty remarks, something uh, quite uh, light and uh, amusing to end the, end the stanza with. So yeah, light lyric certainly fits. But actually, the, the ode that I use as my example is a pretty serious ode. One of Horace's most um, famous sort of philosophical statements comes in it. So I don't think that there is any hard and fast distinction between subject matter. I think it's more what meter you're happy, feeling happiest in as a writer and um, what, you f what you feel is appropriate to the words you want to use. And if there are any words you've particularly got in mind which will fit more easily in one than another, then naturally that's, uh, um, that's a consideration. Okay, the other meter I'm uh, thinking of talking about now is the alcaic. And as I said, this is Horace's meter for his um, grandest um, odes. I think it's um, Horace's single most popular meter, I mean, the one he, he does use more often than any other single meter, but he is very varied, so the others get a, a pretty good uh, look in as well. And, um, oh, there are many great uh, alcaic odes to remember. I mean, the ones I usually use for memory purposes are 214 and 19. I think 214 is one of Horace's uh, greatest odes on death. Um, one, um, one nine is the famous uh, Soracte ode, starting off with the, um, the mountain and going on to, well, wonderful um, reflections on uh, life and uh, young love and the Carpe Diem theme and so on. Of course, there are many others, but those are just my personal uh, preferences for memory purposes. So, um, taking 2.14 as an example, um, this is uh, repeating the person's name, which is quite a significant name in this context, Ehu Fugakes Postume Postume. Ehu Fugakes. Ah, okay, it's postume, postume. <coughs> and you'll notice that the alcaic line is the same as the sapphic line, except shifted up one place. It has a quite significantly different sound, but so it's starting with two longs rather than with one long. But after, after that, it's actually the same thing. 
I mean, if we remember the static line that I was uh, using as an example before, rectius vives, rectius vives licini nequal tum. So it really is just uh, taking the same thing and shifting it one place down and taking the syllable from the end and sticking it back at the beginning again. Um, it's surprising how that really very simple alteration does produce a rather different effect in sound. Um, a rather heavier start to the alcaic, sounds a bit more serious to begin with. Again, a caesura is compulsory, um, and normally, again, after five uh, syllables. Notice how even, obviously, this is a serious ode, the subject is deaf, but nevertheless, there's a much more, ra more rapid sense to the, uh, to the end of the stanza. And that sort of movement from slowness to extreme slowness to rapidity is really extremely subtle, I think, and gives the poet quite a lot of possibilities. So more challenging to write, I think, the archaic than the sapphic, but also an extremely good vehicle for um, serious um, lyric thoughts. I think it doesn't have to be serious. One can express um, frivolous things pretty effectively in the archaic, and Horace often does. And <coughs> indeed, he often uses its sort of changes of um, rhythmical mood to enhance his changes of uh, mood in terms of his content. So uh, in Odes, Odes 1 9, I mean, there's some black humor, I think, in, uh, in Odes uh, 2 14. Um, so it's about death, but um, it has some wit to it. Um, Odes 1 9, I think, is a, is a good example of how his moods change. And he goes from quite serious contemplations uh, on, um, sort of, again, the carpe diem theme, what we should uh, make of our lives, to a, a very frivolous and uh, elusive uh, depiction of love at the end of that poem. So he is making, really making the most of the meter's uh, possibilities. Um, as another example of how this works, I mean, a bit of um, one nine might not hurt. Um, many of you probably do know this ode about uh, seeing the mountain Seracte, um swathed in snow. Um, it is a, a, a very big hill that's sort of coming straight out of a plain on its own, nothing else around it. So sort of the, the deep snowfall on it can be um, an inspiring sight, I imagine, uh, to Romans and to modern uh, visitors if you see it in the winter. Vides, I mean that, actually that's a good example, one nine, of, of the use of this short syllable at the beginning. I mean it starts with the word uh, vides, um, which is, of course, um, video, naturally a short eye. So at the, at the very beginning of a very impressive ode, Horace does allow himself that variation. Vides ut alta stet neve candidum soracte, nec iam sustene Antonus, silvae laborantes galuque, flumine constitarint acuto, dissolve frigus, lignus operfaco, Largae reponens, atque benignius, de prome quadrimum sabina, o taliarche merum diota. Permitte divis catera, qui simul straver eventus aequora fervido, de proiliantis, nec copressi, nec fetteres agitantur orni. Quid sit futurum cras fuge quaer or et? Um, notice actually how he allows himself the word et at the end of that line, which one might think rather ugly and awkward, but I think it works for him. Um, quid sit, and it's, this is a very important line, don't think about what happens tomorrow. That is exactly the carpe diem idea yet again. Quid sit futurum cras fuge quaera et, quem fors dierum cumque dabit lucro apone. Again, a nice enjambment there from uh, one line to the other. Lucro apone, and so on. I think I probably can remember the rest, but perhaps I won't. Uh, trouble you with it uh, right at this moment. I think a wonderful meter, a subtle one, quite challenging to write, but maybe worth the effort if one's feeling ambitious.